Let's start with some history. Part first. History. About three and a half billion years ago, the first cells evolved. They probably looked something like this. About two billion years ago, cells evolved that looked more like this. Eukaryotes. Here's the original bacteria cell for scale. But these cells weren't just larger, they were also chimeras. See these organelles here, the mitochondria and the chloroplast? They were once free-living autonomous bacteria. So these eukaryotic cells are hierarchically more complex because they were made from a symbiotic merger of simpler cells. Around 700 million years ago, multicellularity evolved, eventually giving rise to the animals and plants that you see on this timeline. This is yet another example of previously autonomous creatures merging to form a higher order organism. About 125 million years ago, eusociality evolved. Highly, highly cooperative hives made up of formerly autonomous bees that are now split into three castes, drones, queens, and workers. Today, humans also live in dense groups with social castes, which might indicate that something similar is going on. When you look at all these examples together, an obvious question pops out. What causes these transitions? How do you jump from one level of organism to another? Well, let's hear from Dr. Terence Deacon from a lecture he gave, The Process Underlying Hierarchic Transitions in Evolution. These are some of the most interesting and important things in evolution. And up to this point in time, we have not had a story to tell um, how you get there. So let's tell that story. Terry has outlined four general phases that these transitions go through as they progress, but before we get too abstract, let's just look at an example first. Part second. The genetic example. What I want to do is to talk about this process from the bottom to the top. I want to start at the very low level, at the level of genes themselves. How do you get synergy evolving among genes? So there's a fairly common kind of mutation that happens called a gene duplication. There are several reasons why this might occur, but the end result is that where there was once one gene on the chromosome coding for a protein, now there's an identical copy right next to it which codes for the same protein. And this redundant duplication has a particular effect on the way that natural selection impacts the gene. Most of the time, selection acts as a conservative force. When specific functions evolve, any deviations in the protein that causes them will usually make the function worse. But now that there are two copies of the gene, one copy can remain the same while the other is free to wander around and explore possibilities without so much risk of negative effect. So what's happening is the original function is preserved because of the redundancy, and now you get sort of a random walk of alternatives that are just slightly off or variant from the original function. If this slightly variant function actually produces something useful, that is by having two slightly variant versions of the same thing, you can do sort of more than one thing. You can have your cake and eat it too, so to speak. So for example, if you have a stick, it can have any number of functions, like, I don't know, for nose picking or something like that. And if you duplicate the stick, the duplication will have all of the same nose picking functions. But in addition, putting the two sticks together can produce some unique unique synergies. A new synergy can arise. The two can begin to complement one another. And if they complement one another, both of them will now be selected, not just for the function, but for how they complement each other. That is, there will be a level of selection that's now not just on the individual, but it's distributed across two or more variants. A good example of this is the evolution of color vision. Our eyes detect light by using a family of proteins called rhodopsins. Here's a graph of rhodopsin light sensitivity. The first rhodopsin to evolve was probably broadly sensitive to the entire spectrum of visible light, with a peak sensitivity somewhere in the middle. But once the rhodopsin gene was duplicated, the copy was free to vary, and maybe wandered its way to having a narrower sensitivity closer to the red side. Another duplication could make a more blue sensitive protein, or green. Having these different kinds of rhodopsins created a higher level synergy. Natural selection could then push the different proteins to divergent regions of the spectrum so that altogether they could create color vision. And this pattern of redundancy giving rise to synergy can be found all over the tree of life. This should be exhibited at all levels, and in fact this becomes a generic way of talking about how it is that higher order levels are generated. So now that we've seen what the genetic example looks like, we can look at this process more generally. Part third, the general process. 
This transition takes place over four phases, duplication, masking, degeneration, and complementation. In the duplication phase, some function gets copied. Duplication in some more form or another, that is redundancy of some functional consequence, actually reduces selection. Reduces selection, that's the next phase, masking, where redundancy masks selection that keeps function consistent. The pressure of selection to maintain what we call purifying selection, to eliminate variations, is relaxed. In the next step, degeneration, function breaks down slightly because of the masking. The relaxation begins to produce variations in functions that are closely related to each other. Then, in the last phase, new complementary synergies emerge. So the duplicates can actually play partial supportive roles for each other and cause um, each one of them to vary more synergistically with respect to each other. So that's the general story. Now let's take a look at a more complicated example. Part fourth, vitamin C. This time, redundancy isn't caused by gene duplication, but rather by the environment taking on some of the functions of the organism. A simple example of an external functional duplication occurred with respect to the synthesis of ascorbic acid, vitamin C. Most other animals, from fish to rats, can produce their own vitamin C endogenously. But primates are different. Our bodies can't make it on their own, so we need to eat fruit. Regularly. And the answer why turns out to fit very nicely into this hierarchic transition story. The logic of this, I think, is pretty straightforward. We begin with a normally endogenously producing gene that's in the genome, but somewhere around 35 million years ago, the ancestors of monkeys and apes began to eat fruit. As we begin to regularly eat these sources of food, we begin to have external duplication of this function. The gene can now acquire certain mutations. At some point, if enough mutations are acquired, selection is now distributed to other ports in the genome that make it more likely that we'll constantly have availability of fruit. So eating lots of fruit relax selection on the vitamin C gene, which in turn increased selection on other adaptations, which ensured that fruit was reliably consumed. And one of those adaptations was, wait for it, color vision. You need color vision to find ripe fruit. Not only are primates unique among mammals in their lack of vitamin C producing ability, they are also unique in their ability to see color. And these two uniquenesses are connected by the same pattern. What you can see from this is that I'm beginning to build up a story about how you get higher order synergies using the same kind of logic again and again. This vitamin C color vision example is important because it shows how functions like the production of vitamin C can be offloaded onto the environment. But what happens when the environment is another organism? Part fifth, endosymbiosis. This kind of logic is also relevant to the evolution of eukaryotic cells from prokaryotic cells. As mitochondria and chloroplasts have become internalized into a cell, now they're a little bit like duplicate genes. When the mitochondria and the chloroplasts were independent from their hosts, they each had autonomous metabolisms. Both the host and the symbiont had all the genes they needed to get by in the world. But once they started living closer together, you had two redundant metabolisms performing the same function, and so they degraded, and then synergies emerged. The host cell lost the parts of its metabolism that the mitochondria and the chloroplasts could do better, and the organelles lost the genes for, well, almost everything. Most of their bodies are now built by the host. We have this process in which you produce this higher order, much more complex cell type. But in the process, you had to both have duplication and degeneration, degradation of the genome of both genomes. Each have become dependent on each other, a codependent, so to speak. What's unique about this story is that it outlines a path for completely new levels of organism to evolve, which does not rely on natural selection for increased complexity. In fact, just the opposite, it relies on relaxed selection and degradation. It's only when the adaptations that ensure autonomy degrade that new higher order synergies can emerge. We need to stop thinking about hierarchic evolution in simple Darwinian terms. We need to be able to think about it both in terms of selection and the loss of selection or the reduction of selection. 
and that maybe it's the reduction of selection that's responsible for some of the most interesting features. One of the most interesting features of the history of life is this pattern of complexification and symbiosis. And this story of redundancy leading to synergy brings us one step closer to understanding how it happens. This is one way of talking about how it is that, first of all, higher order synergies can show up, can be coordinated with loss of autonomy at the lower levels, and then in effect, once the synergy is present, there is now going to be selection to maintain that synergy, especially if that synergy is dependent upon things that are outside the genome, social, for example, or between organisms like in symbiosis. Part last. Us. There's a pattern here. This story applies to genes, to cells, to monkeys and fruit trees, and critically, to us. We recognize that life is better when we cooperate, but at every step of the way, we risk losing our autonomy, our freedom. For us, at a social level, that question, how do you get there from here, is the critical question. How do you move from autonomous, selfish behavior incrementally to truly synergistic, codependent behavior. I think our species has partly gone that way. That's why we're the way we are. But we have a long way to go. Perhaps in the distant future, we'll be able to look at all of the wars and breakups and conflicts of today as threads of an unbroken evolutionary process. From genes, to cells, to bodies, to communities, we all face the same tensions between synergy and autonomy. But the history of life tells us that this tension can be resolved. Who knows what the next transition will bring? Thanks for watching. This video is part of a class called the Evo Seminar Series. We host lecturers like Terry who give detailed presentations on evolutionary topics, and then we make videos which compress those lectures into nice, consolidated, shareable form. There's a link to Terry's much, much more thorough lecture in the description below, and if you like this video, give it a thumbs up or send it to your friend, and you can hit that subscribe button for more. I'll see you later.